Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cinema Savvy. It is myself, George, joined once more by Tate for another entry in the David Fincher retrospective. And this week, we arrive at Gone Girl, the 2014 adaptation of the book of the same name. And I have been looking forward to this mm. because it's Gone Girl. It, it's, it's, there's a lot to talk about this video today, and, and I can't wait to talk about this film. But first of all, Tate, how are you doing today? Yeah, doing good. Uh, this is this is one of those films where when we went for this retrospective, I put a note next to it. I was like, okay, this one. This one, I remember liking it on previous watches, but I couldn't remember every detail. But the second the intro started, bang, I was straight back into it. And I was like, oh, I know what I'm getting into here. So I'm really looking forward to talking about it a little bit more. Yeah, and I think that's kind of where I'm at, that when, when this series was announced, we know we were doing this a little bit later than normal. Gongo sort of popped up, like, you've got this great run of films. There's a few, you know, I hadn't seen, but it's like, I know Mank came out. I know The Killer's coming out. I know they're both Netflix films, but this is technically mm. the last, like, Fincher film that had a proper cinema release, which is quite remarkable. And obviously, I remember seeing it, which we'll talk about very briefly. But um, as always, we do want to hear from people at home, so please do comment with your thoughts on Gone Girl, whether you enjoy it, whether you not, whether you've read the book, that'd be really interesting. One again, it's another adaptation from Fincher from a novel. Um, your thoughts on the cast? Uh, there's obviously we're going to talk about. There was a big bit of film news whilst this was filming, which is undoubtedly a big talking point as always. Um, so do get involved, and if you like the series, we're almost at the end, so you can backtrack to the other ones. And we've obviously got a couple more coming as we build up to the killer released on Friday the tenth. And if you're watching it on Monday the thirtieth, if it's out in limited UK cinemas as they always are, like independent cinemas every man's uh, and showcase i think that the only two chains that sort of do it and you know netflix hooray meanwhile because of flower moon apple here you go have a wide release everywhere every cinema everywhere Thank you. <laughs> so yeah not to moan about streaming but uh, go on go i don't have that but um mm. as well as that you can find us on all our social medias we're on twitter facebook letterboxd instagram and you can do so at linktree.com slash cinema savvy and red bubble to pick up some merch but tate the IMDb mm. plot synopsis. Let's uh, let, let's see what they've got. Yes, with his wife's disappearance having become the focus of an intense media circus, a man sees the spotlight turned on him when it's suspected that he may not be innocent. That's very wordy for this one. Um, I mean, they literally could have just said "girl gone?" question mark, and that would have done enough to explain the film. Um, Amazing Amy question mark. Yeah. Literally, um, this um, this film is very simple in its kind of premise. Um, girl goes missing, and then it's all about the media frenzy behind it. Yeah. And there are twists and turns in this film, but realistically, this film is a very simple setup. And I mean, I guess in conjunction with the book, it's very well executed. Um, this this is one of my favorite Fincher films. I really really like this. And as far as my memories of the film. I remember there being a lot of people talking about it when it came out. I remember it being the book of the summer. I haven't read it myself, um, but I remember a lot of people talking about it. I remember seeing it on the news, it being a similar to Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, our last kind of review. Um, people were talking about this book and people were talking about this film adaptation that was coming out. Um, I remember the media frenzy behind it. I also somewhat remember quite a big push for Rosamund Pike to win Best Actress that year. Um, and I, from memory, I thought she had won it, but she hadn't. And I was really shocked when I looked today and I was like, oh, yeah, she won the Oscar, didn't she? Oh, she didn't win the Oscar. Oh, really? She didn't win the Oscar? Um, so really unusual that um, that's different memories of how I remember events and stuff like that. Um, but I really enjoyed it on first watch. Um, I really enjoyed it on second watch. And I was really looking forward to watching it again uh, this time around. Yeah, I'm in a weird spell of this. We sort of set the point like that. I, I saw this when it came out. And this is what's really strange. I remember going to the cinema to watch this film, not just on the release day. Uh, we don't get it often in the UK. We get preview screenings the night before, so it's it's way more common. I think every single film in America has Thursday night previews, and it's been something that's never took off here in the UK. It pops up once in a while. Like I mentioned on our Killers video last week that that was a Thursday night IMAX, 7 o'clock, no normal screenings, just the IMAX is at 7. Spider-Verse had the same thing earlier this year, and... It's, it's a strange thing that it's not really took off here, but the studios haven't really backed it to take off. Um, and for whatever reason, I'm pretty sure we watched Gone Girl at like 10 o'clock at night before it came out. 
I, why was it the cinema at 10 o'clock at night the day per film came out? It's, it's hardly, I mean, it's a long film, it's 2.30. Absolutely flies by the, the runtime. Um, but I just, in my head, I'm not criticizing that fact, I was like, I was really hyped for this film. And I, I actually think I might have been able to pinpoint it down to something we'll talk about. This was very much in my comic book era, of like mm. stuff. And obviously, a certain Mr. Ben Affleck was cast as Batman contextually while Gone Girl was filming. And I think in my head, I was so G'd up for this because it was like Bat Bat Bat. Like Argo, of course, had been out as well. Um, and I just think that was something like obviously Fincher from studying when I was younger, but I just, I'm trying to remember why I was so desperate to see it so soon because I hadn't read the book. I, I hadn't, I don't think I even remember any trailers, but I absolutely loved the film. One of the most gripping dramas uh, I've ever seen at a cinema, I'm being really honest. It's not the normal film I'd see at the cinema back then. This is 2014. I think it was like mm-hmm. the time. And um, yeah. sort of sad that I'm going to say this is the last, I, I, I don't care, Mank. I, it's the last sort of Finch film we've had at the cinema. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also not a big fan of Mank. I know that's going to be coming up. Great in the future, plug for but... next week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's what happened. And I said, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know if I saw this at home. I have the Blu ray and I should have got it out. Hmm. The Blu ray I picked up on release date and every single Blu ray came with an amazing Amy book. And it wasn't like a special edition or anything. Hmm. Every single Blu ray came with this amazing Amy like slip covery thing. And I was like, it's such a random thing to put on it, but it's cool. Uh, yeah. And I kind of miss that we don't really have things like that anymore with films. Uh, and it's once again, you know, pushing that physical media stuff that I own it. It's not a nightmare to find our streaming services. It's, it's none of that. It was, I've got very fond memories. And this is the one that's, that's jumped out. I think, you know, we started this, right? When we started the series, we know we're going to get Alien 3 for better or worse. We know we're going to then get 7 and very quickly after Fight Club. I know social media is the one you're looking forward to most, not social media, sorry, social, social network. Social network, yeah. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was sort of gone girl. I like, always looking at that poster, looking at that, you know, the placement. I hadn't seen the film before it. So I didn't care for one after. So it was just a big hurrah moment. And, and yeah, I've got real fun memories of this. I, I think it's an incredible film. And it could be Finch's best film. I could, the big, the big word there. Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't think you held it that highly. For me, it's top five, but I, I'm. Oh, definitely top five. Like top, top three five. for me. Top but, four, top and four. I guess, I guess we'll go into it later not critically well critically received well but i mean it was a stacked year and i guess I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to the oscars section but um treated probably a bit too harshly by the academy awards in the end um overlooked we overlooked massively and that year was a year of many overlooks and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later on uh, because that year i think is the year where everyone got very pissed off at the academy awards for various different reasons um but yes, uh, should we move on to production? Absolutely. So we mentioned uh, Gillian Finn wrote the novel. Again, we, neither of us have read it. But what's really interesting, and this is what I want to sort of pinpoint, is that she adapted her own screenplay for the very first draft. Uh, and even more intriguing than that, uh, this caught me off guard. The, the, the production rights were picked up by Reese Witherspoon's production company. Pleasure. I don't have the name to hands. Reese Witherspoon's had a very successful career as a producer, as half people that don't know. And she'd cast... I guess, like what a lot of actors do, right? When they buy the rights for stuff, they cast themselves in, in the role they want to play. Um, but Gillian Fenn had wrote her first draft. And if anyone's curious about this, it's very rare for an author to make the jump to screenplay. And make the film. To, to adapt her own work. This is her very first film screenplay. She's only had a second film credit, which is remarkable. She co-wrote Widows in 2018, the incredible Steve McQueen film. Uh, and that really caught me off guard that she's technically wrote two films, Gone Girl and Widows, and we haven't had a third one. So please get back to writing films. Doing film. um, but more interesting than that, Reese Witherspoon essentially dropped out when they sort of not realised that the level would be needed to play Amy. But I think Reese Witherspoon did a very honourable thing and perhaps realised that she would be miscast as Amy, given, you know... She's too, almost too, not good girl she's, image. I don't want to say she's typecast, but she's legally bond, right? It's, like, yeah, of course. Um, can we see? Can we see Reese Witherspoon slit someone's throat? No. I mean, I mean, not in a horrible way. Like, I don't actually see you kill someone, which is watching. I, mean, I for the context of the film, it would probably make it a bit more shocking. But yeah. 
You need a different director. The whole if Re- yeah. Reese's River Spoon, amazing aim. It's like you know about the, the Spielberg Interstellar, isn't it? It's like mm. Spielberg had. A, if for those that don't know, you can read the draft. It's insane. But Spielberg's Interstellar was basically like Journey to the Center of the Earth, like this magical, fun experience. Like enter Christopher Nolan, who rewrites it uh, for his brother instead. And it's like there we go. That's what we got. Um, and it does happen with a lot of films, a lot of adapted adaptations. But I do want to actually. I was going to talk about J.K. Rowling, and and not politics, thankfully, but Mm. I was trying to think of authors that have actually adapted their own work. And, of course, the first two Fantastic Beasts films, J.K. Rowling had wrote. Uh, She had done The Jump. She hadn't wrote the Harry Potters. She'd she'd been involved. And and the whole whole selling point of Fantastic Beasts was J.K. Rowling's now writing these films. And look what happened to those films. That, That was very clear. Stephen King is a famous one, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's done a done lot of adaptations of his own work. I can't really think of any off the top of my head past that. There'll but... be a lot more. Uh, I, I can't remember. I don't think so. I think, I think genuinely it's quite a rare thing to happen. Um, it's a very different writing style as well. It's a I very mean, different it's... writing style. But I guess because you know the material yourself, it's going to be very reasonably accurate to um, what yeah. you have envisioned in your head. And George R. R. Martin, the early seasons of yeah. Game of Thrones, for obvious reasons. I mean, why it was so obvious. Re- realistically, I think it's it's good because it gives the vision of what uh, Gillian Flynn thought of when she was writing the book. It, it immediately gives off exactly what she wants. And also it means that as the author, she can go in and tweak different things that are made like, oh, there you go. Um, Last of Us, person who did Last of Us, um, TV show and game. Because Neil didn't... Druckmann. Yeah, Neil Druckmann, because he wrote the yeah. game and then he made slight tweaks and improvements to the TV show in his own way. Um, and that's kind of a perfect example of that. Um, that you're able to take your original piece and, I mean, I don't know how far it varies from the book itself, but you're able to go and make your own kind of adaptation of your own work and you're able to kind of tweak little things and make things better and put it to screen. Yeah, I I mean, and I think what's kind of interesting is this is that Gillian Finn also brought on board bringing more Harry Potter references in, Steve Cloves. Now, for anyone that doesn't know who Steve Cloves is, he, I mean, there's a lot of reasons the Harry Potter films are so successful, but I believe he worked on the entirety of the, the the book adaptations. So in terms of adapting page to screen, absolutely nailed it, especially when you look at those latter books and how they're 600 pages and you can only do a two-hour film and the cuts and changes that had to be done. And again, not to sort of mock J.K. Rowling, but Steve Close was brought in for Fantastic Beasts 3, leaving it a bit late to bring him back. Um, yeah, didn't work out for obvious reasons. That, that series is done. Um, but it does make you think that, had there been a Steve Close trilogy of doing it from himself or whether he was asking to kind of don't know or whether they just hired an actual screenwriter to do that story would have been much, much, much better. But that's the last we can talk about Harry Potter because we're talking David Fincher. And here's another interesting one. David Fincher's brought on board to this with Gillian Flynn attached. And he's happy to have her staying signed on for the film. Now, this is where it gets intriguing because I couldn't find the articles past this. Normally with a director... They've got their own creative vision, especially in Autel like Fincher, uh, like like a Nolan, like a James Cameron, whatever you want to say with those. They'll have their collaborative team. They'll have their team. They'll come on board and say, this is my film now. This is my project. Thanks for what you've done already, but it's time for me to take over. I kind of love the fact that Fincher was happy for her to work with him. And now it, someone could say it's common sense. She's wrote the book. But at the same time, sometimes directors want to put their own stamp on this. They don't just want... This is a really... This happens more, I think, with games to TV slash film or comics, but an adaptation is adapting a, a bit of work. It doesn't have to be a carbon copy shot for shot. No. Disney live action remakes of the evidence. Uh, and they should be able to go their own direction, maybe not to an extremity. It's still got to respect that, that original source, but I'm, I'm not talking like ridiculous, it's like all that nonsense Lord of the Rings stuff from last year. But... Um, I am very, I don't want to say surprised she said on board, but what are your thoughts with with Fincher signing on and then sort of almost allowing, like the, the concept is he agrees to let her stay on board. So she might have turned in the first draft and Fincher might have said, thank you very much, I'll take it from here, which is what he's done on his other films. Um, going back to Seven, when we spoke about that, is that he, he got rid of all the newer drafts, got the original first draft and went with it. Uh, and I think it's very curious. It's the first time he sort of kept someone on board in that creative standpoint. But I'm curious for your thoughts on that too. Maybe finally, I, I guess with kind of a film and I guess with a book like this, it's quite dark anyway. And Fincher films tend to be quite dark. Um, so maybe the first draft he quite liked. Maybe he was like, actually, do you know what? We could do something here. And he didn't have to make a ridiculous amount of tweaks to it. Um, 
I mean, if he if he enjoyed the book, then you know he'd probably enjoy you know the person who wrote the book adapting it. And maybe he was curious to see kind of what creative decisions were made because, like we said, it's unusual to have a writer go and do a book and then go and do a screen adaptation of it. Um, so I guess that's my kind of thoughts. Maybe Fincher was very much on board with that and enjoyed the creative decisions being made. Yeah, no, I can see that. And I think if we keep talking Fincher as well, mm. there's not really as much... If, we, if we're talking like behind the scenes of this, there's no... This actor says this. This actor says this. There's a few interesting bits of the character pieces we can talk about with, with Neil Patrick Harris and, and Rosamund Pike, but mm. with with Fincher himself, and this is where I'm curious. Not that the James Cameron experience was funny because everybody would come on and say this person was almost killed by James Cameron. Yes, I mean, it's not funny, but it's cool. <laughs> like every week it's just like this person almost drowned. Doesn't want to talk about it. This person was put through hell by James Cameron. Fincher ones are people just would are oh, moaning. There's a lot of takes, but you got to think it could take you 2014. I mean, people knew what they were getting into years before. 2014, he is not just a household name. He's had his biggest hits back-to-back in terms of mm. back-to-back box office. He's had more Oscar nominations, more uh, involvement of those films. The scales got bigger in respect to their successes. Everyone signing on for this would know exactly what's getting. I just think it, it sort of withers uh, those sort of stories. And then there's a really funny behind the scenes one. It's, it's more of Neil Patrick Harris. When he pulls up in the car, this is one of the famous things mm. where he did it on the first go, it was perfect, they moved on. And I love that. There's something about that. The fact it's it's a car manoeuvre, it's not throwing, you know, like a notebook on a on a table like we've had in other ones. An actual, like, I think it's the breaking into the garage. Yeah. Is nailed perfectly first attempt. And that's it, they moved on. And I kind of love that because it, it puts to bed all this ridiculous, he does 100 takes. Like, he's going to do it to his right in his head. And the first one was enough. And I think that's quite remarkable. Well, it, it shows how much of a perfectionist he is by the fact that he was like, do you know what? That is perfect. I know exactly what I want straight away. And that's kind of what you want for a director. You don't really want kind of uh, umming and ahhing and stuff like that. If he's got a creative vision, he knows exactly what he wants from it, then he's going to get exactly what he wants from it. And at this stage, he's a well-known and well kind of accoladed enough, you know, director to be able to go in and just, you know, say, do you know what? I'm right here. We're going to get this absolutely nailed on and people know what they're getting on board with anyway with all the stories that came forward from it so at, at this stage I, I think there's no arguments at all and it is quite funny that they managed to get you know at least one shot bang on first time um but yeah interesting yeah and just kind of saying that we'll just talk one, one thing before we get into the direction mm. itself but the they averaged around five hours of footage a day which is like for anyone that's been on a film set that is insane like confirmed yeah. footage five hours a day that's the multiple takes that is also probably the efficiency of those productions, the structure, the planning. That mm. one thing is interesting, Finch, is that he does have longer shoots because they do plan on shooting things for longer because of that. They're never, it's not like a rush job, like a lot of productions where it's you've got three days now to film these scenes and go over budget. It is, this has all been meticulously planned out for him to shoot in a very specific way. And even like set decoration, they couldn't light the inside of the house the way they wanted. So they green screens every single window to fix the lighting and post. Mm. If more remarkably for people to do editing, the entirety of post production was done on Premiere Pro, which is ridiculous. That a film, the six million dollar, it, it's like the um the whole. I, I, I the mean, it's being shot on a five K yeah. camera, right? It's like it's a it's it's a household thing. I edit on Premiere Pro, so I'm gonna look as good as a Gone Girl. Mm. Um, but it's the like fact that a, a, sixty, a sixty million dollar film and stuff like that managed to get five hours of footage a day, and also stayed within that budget, and also did everything on. Prim- it's, it's just a weird stacking of things. Um, it's good. <laughs> and <laughs> I, more I, films I think, are made like this. And I think that shows the Fincher as well that he's like not that attributes to resource, but you never hear these wild stories of everything went wrong on set. Bar Alien mm. Three, it is very much. He's got this collaborative team. They know, he knows what he wants. They know what he wants, and they'll work with him until he gets there. Uh, and there's a story with this where like Ben Affleck was sort of playing a joke on on David Fincher, where Ben Affleck changed the lens on the camera, and mm. they had a bet with like another assistant, and they basically turned around and Fincher looked at the camera, was like, "There's something off with this camera." Yeah, and it's the little things like that that I just think are very not like interesting, but the Ben Affleck. We'll talk about the casting later, but. Ben Affleck's a director actor at this point. He's been doing feature films. He's won best film at this point in time, I think. Argo's yeah, Argo's yeah, Argo is twenty twelve, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, was robbed of Best Director, well, a nomination for Best Director, which was sort of embarrassing at the same time for them to didn't nominate him. And he was desperate. He delayed a project to be involved in this. And I think that's what goes to show that if a director wants to learn from another, I don't want to just keep saying Nolan, but Kenneth Branagh spoke about Nolan recently. Kenneth Branagh, a director of, of decades, uh, let alone theatre work. And he spoke about the first time I worked with Nolan Dunker because like Christopher and Corsi, you pick up, it doesn't matter that I'm a director. Like I was going to be involved. Now he's in four films in a row. And I'm just going to say like Ben Affleck's also bar on the subject. He's a pretty excellent lead in a Fincher film too. Mm. And I, I guess, yeah, we'll talk about his casting in a bit. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating that all these actors are coming forward to Fincher as a director. As soon as you kind of get picked for it, or as soon as he has inquiries about it, you're immediately on board with it, yeah. you know? And yeah, it's fascinating. He used a lot of first time people in this film. Pretty, pretty much all of the main cast are first time players from Fincher film, but it seems to work in this film as far as the ensemble's concerned. Yeah. Uh, I mean, let's, let's talk some the direction. So mm. we're, we're 11 films in now. We've been doing this for, for 11 weeks. We sort of sat at the, uh, sat at the back. What? Uh, started at the beginning. Mm. And we sort of said from like seven onwards, like his, his, I don't want to say his direction doesn't get better. That That's sort of insulting to his craft. I, I think his ability is there from sort of day one, right? Let's not count Alien because it's not his fault when I'm there. But his ability is clear. And I think what's happened as time has gone by, the industry sort of reacts to his work. That, as we're saying, right, in the early days of seven, he's not going to be able to shoot the way he would. And I don't want to say, oh, if this was maybe be completely different, not, not any, anything like that at all, but it'd be a longer shooting schedule. Probably a very different cast, it'd be a very different setup. And I just think his scale as, as a filmmaker. Is, is so different and because he's done this whole variety of not dramas back to back but you look at Benjamin Button which is this sort of romance yes there's a drama in there then you can jump to Social Network which is a biopic then you've got the the thriller in the mystery thriller with Girl of the Dragon Tattoo and then Gone Girl is a bit more akin to Girl of the Dragon Tattoo not just because there's a girl in the title but mm. if you look at his work this is one where back to back with Dragon Tattoo it makes a lot of sense in respect when, of this is project, another when, adaptation. When I think of Fincher, I immediately think of the word thriller. I don't think of his dramas. I don't think of um, Mank or whatever he was doing with that film. I don't even think of it. I, I just think he is like the king of thrillers. He does brilliant thriller films. And I, I can't remember who it was who we had on discussion for it, but saying um, it may have been Paul on the last one about how he picks these kind of complicated and intricate female almost protagonists in his films and stuff yeah. like that um and focuses on them and focuses a lot on um you know male kind of what's the word um like toxic masculinity and stuff like that within the film um and this this kind of almost epitomizes that this is this is very much kind of leans heavily into that in this film um and he has developed over the years because this film has one of my favorite shots that he's done in any of his films. And it's two shots. It's the first shot and it's the last shot. Um, but you can still see his directional traits. You can still see his kind of trademark on it. And he still kind of holds that kind of tense thriller nature. And like you said, when you first watched this, this was one of the most intense films you can watch. Um, I went from kind of, you know, sitting down, chilled out, relaxed um, whilst watching this at the festival um, kind of, on, on my own, just like, oh, yeah, I'm just kind of throw it on, watch it and kind of chill out to kind of sitting bolt upright and being fully invested in the film. Um, so, you know, it, he's he's that kind of director to have that kind of effect on you. Yeah, and what I kind of like of this, if you sort of talk about some of the story, the structure, you mentioned thriller as well. You mentioned tension, setting up. The whole structure of this film, from the opening act of oh, who's Amy? What's happened to Amy? To the second act, which is fucking hell. Like, oh, no, not like that's she's Amy. insane. Uh... Yeah, like, and I won't forget the first, you know, the moment it cuts to the, the narration, the voiceover, everything. And then obviously act three, where it sort of falls apart and, and picks up for it. It's it's such a remarkable structure of the story. And again, I don't know how the novel is, so I can't sort of draw comparisons to that, but it it's such a unique way, way to do it because we don't want Amy to you need to set up the mystery to make her dynamic as a 
terrible person worse. And mm. you know, the, you look the opening act. There's sort of not that you feel bad for it, but you sense there's something off about Amy. There's something very strange about how she's been. Obviously, Nick Dunn doesn't care for her. Marg doesn't care, and you're kind of wondering, says, you know, what what's up with this person? Why is there this tension? And when it's you know the whole second act's like faking the pregnancy, it, it's easy to sort of drum hole into one, but. I can't fault the screenplay. Uh, and I actually think that the screenplay is, is this film. There's a couple of standouts in this film, mm. whether that's performances from a technical aspect or whatnot. The things I've, and it's a bit like Social Network, very different to Social Network, but the screenplay is almost perfect. I can't fault any of that, um, if I'm being really honest. It's not the best screenplay ever. But for, for how the film is structured with that screenplay, they absolutely nail it. And again, I think that's because they're bringing on board the writer of the book. If there are changes that have been made, then they've probably been done. Maybe there's a couple of paragraphs merged into, what, into a couple of lines of dialogue. Who knows? But every single scene we see has its own payoff, whether it's later on in the film, whether it's preceding it. And when you get to that ending, it's like a, well, like, even the opening scene is back to the, I want to sort of crack a head in. And mm. they have the look, which is the final shot. Well. It's just, as George would say, it's like poetry, it rhymes. But what are your thoughts on, on, on this? I mean, I haven't even really spoken about the story. I'm just talking structure yeah. story. No, what are your thoughts um, on that? This, this story is basically set up as multiple Chekhov's guns and they slowly start firing off in random directions. You don't know whether you're going to get hit or not. Um, it's really well set up. You get pretty much all the information laid out for you in the kind of opening kind of hour or so. And then the entire story flips on its head and you're left kind of scrambling to try and kind of pick up the pieces it's so well put together and that is down to the screenplay i i once again i feel like maybe we should have found someone who's actually read the book um on this one um but i'm tempted to read the book after kind of watching this again um but it's so well structured in that sense it's so well kind of laid out with you kind of get the mystery first you get the mystery solved and then you kind of have to get out of the situation um, you feel for one character and then suddenly you hate that character's guts and it kind of keeps on flipping like that throughout the film and you realize by the end of it they're not they're both kind of not horrible people but they're both pretty bad and they kind of almost made for each other and it's it's a heartbreaking ending in some respects but it's also like well you know it's his decision in the end and you know he could have walked away but he's sticking with her because he realizes that you know that's realistically the only option he's got um it's it's, it's a game it's of brilliant. chess mm. it, 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 and and you know what this is a horrible 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 comparison right did you see the ben affleck film last year with anna dmas i did not see the ben affleck film with anna dmas i'm i'm pretty sure you'd heard about it right like everybody I, I, heard i've about heard it. multiple things about that film i can't remember the name of the film but i've heard yeah interesting um, things about that film. let me grab the deep water here we go deep water right <laughs> The most, if there's ever been a marketing campaign, or it's not even a marketing campaign. Obviously, everyone knows the story. It's very it powerful. Like Gone Girl's marketing campaign, not going to well, play. Like, <laughs> well, this this is it. So I saw it last year for I the yeah. screen, and I remember watching it. Right, and I was like, I feel like I've seen this film before, and I, I didn't like it. I thought it was dreadful. Hmm. I got to see the Gone Girl the other day, and I was like, fucking hell, deep wall. And I remember some people talking about Gone Girl when it came out, but I, I didn't rewatch really Gone Girl. I was like, why is Ben Affleck in a shit version of Gone Girl? When he's in Gone Girl, and and it's the same logic. It's a dreadful game of chess, whereas this is an exquisite game of chess. Mm. Um, uh, and I ju I just couldn't sort of quite believe it. I kept going back to that that dreadful film. Everyone remembers it because obviously they got together in real life. You know, yeah. uh, there's, there's no hiding. It. We don't really talk personal stuff, but going back to Gone Girl, I thank God for this because I'll tell you what I've missed, and I haven't seen Air yet from this year, which was meant to be very good. Ben Affleck, I believe, is a massively underrated actor. Uh, I know I've, been, I've not even seen 2003's Daredevil. I know it's got its fans. I know the director's cut's meant to be actually really good, or supposedly really good, probably a better term. I think he's always had a pretty, I don't want to say like tough image, but for reasons I don't genuinely know, he's always seemed to have had people against him. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I not talking private life. The, uh, is it the attitude of the fact that him and Matt Damon kind of broke broke their way into Hollywood uh, with Goodwill Hunting? Maybe like I, that, I, I've just never really known. Like I just feel that is it the projects he picks? Is it his agent? Mm. Because he's an unbelievable actor, and I, I think Fincher, as Fincher has done throughout so much of his career, 
has been able, again, I'm not saying every Ben Affleck film, but this is probably my favourite Ben Affleck performance. Um, I'm not going to talk about DC. I think he was clearly given a signed on board to direct a Batman film more so than star in it. And who wouldn't want to star and direct their own Batman film? Do you know what I mean? But it, it, and obviously he's had his, his personal issues, you know, which he spoke about, in which he's recovering, which is great. And it's amazing. Whenever videos pop up of him like thriving, I absolutely love it. I know he's married to Jayla now. But I'm a, I'm a really big fan of Ben Affleck. And I think the film not just starts and ends with his performance, but if, if either of the two leads are miscasts, don't have the chemistry, because there is a chemistry in this film, the chemistry between the performers more so than the characters, and they absolutely have it. I think the whole film can't function if you get that wrong. And I just think he's on his absolute A game with this. I know I'm sort of all over the place talking the story, but fundamentally, I love the fact that the casting of him even goes back to Fincher. He'd seen pictures of him online doing the smile, the smiles all over the camp, the marketing, the smiles over the posters, images you see. And it, it, I believe that there was not fan casting because it's not really a thing for novels, but apparently from day one, Ben Affleck was a name attached to the project that people were circling. And apparently, David Finch is very aware of like public opinion for films, which I find very intriguing for a director to openly admit to. I know he mm. doesn't really do commercial films, which is probably why it's not as bad to hear it. Um, but so what are your thoughts on, on the Ben Affleck? Story? I know sort of skip story somewhat, but the story, I mean, really... story, story kind of tells itself. It's, it's all about the structure. It's all about kind of the twisting of the game and it's a thriller and people, people screwing each other over. That's kind of the story of it. And it all ends up kind of back at square one, but with way different circumstances. Um, as far as, Ben Affleck's concerned. I, I I mean, I've always liked him as an actor. Um, I think he's put on some good performance in his career. He's also put on some of the worst performances I've ever seen from actors. Um, so, you know, it's, he's one of those actors where sometimes he gets the right project and he's casting it well and he does a good job of it. And sometimes he, he doesn't quite meet it. Um, like I said, well, like you said, kind of certain parts of Batflick were good. Certain parts maybe weren't so, but maybe that's down to the writing. Um, but I've always respected him as an actor and he, he tends to do a decent job in most of the films he does. And in this film, I probably think it's difficult to say whether this is best in his career. Um, I'd have to rewatch all of his other ones because I'd have liked performances before that he's been in. Um, but he definitely plays off that kind of always smiling, but also kind of cursing and swearing in the background when things kind of go wrong and, you know, wanting to put on a good public figure face, but you know, that's that's his way of kind of dealing with things and he just kind of gets twisted into the media because of that and it's it's kind of fascinating of all the different kind of the intricacies of the character that kind of get unveiled including the affair and various other things and he's just kind of like scrambling to cover it up and i think i think his performance is tied down to two relationships here it's tied down to the kind of relationship he has with you know rosman pike in the scenes where they are together and kind of the i mean they're not on screen for very long together but you know the building up of the relationship that we see between them when they're separated if that makes sense yeah, back and forth yeah. they give and stuff like that and also kind of his relationship with his twin sister which really grounds the film because it's almost like having kind of an, an echo that gives opinions if that makes sense like you know it's the line of you know i'll always be with you i was with you before we were born kind of that sticks with me because that's how close those characters are and having someone close to him going through the same things getting dragged into it as well and you know giving him a second opinion like hating him for having the affair but also kind of respecting and understanding his decision to wanting to walk away and it, it, there's so many things that are attached to it and you know all three of those kind of main characters play it off so well um um so i really kind of enjoy the dynamics they have together yeah i, I mean we'll talk rosman quite briefly you, you mentioned margo played by carrie coon now i'd never mm. seen carrie coon in anything before and i didn't realize I this was the first time this is her first ever film credit. She did a lot of stage stuff. She's probably most well known for Ghostbusters. She did a couple of TV shows before this, but her first film credit, and I think she's great in this. And the whole the twin dynamic, I love, and I love the fact that every character feels real. And one of the arts of, of, of writing is dialogue. That so many films, you you listen to the dialogue, and it's just so blatantly scripted in the sense of this has to be said for story purposes. It never feels like there's natural conversations. And with Gone Girl, the script is, is so tight with this that it does feel like a brother-sister dynamic. There's not like over-the-top comedy. It's not over-the-top drama on this. 
it feels very real at, at the moments where they're sort of testing one another, where she's starting to question him. That's an incredible bit, I think, to do because you can feel the sort of not pain in him, but the fact she's consciously starting to choose, saying, you know, this is basically going bad to us for, for all of us, not just to you. And I kind of like how aware it is. And you mentioned the media representation as well. This is a huge part of this. And I don't want to make the obvious comparison to the Madeleine McCann case, very different. Mm. Um, but how the like a, a 21st century media would cover something like this, esteemed author who is beloved because of the book she wrote. No one could imagine her being a detestable, ranted person, but this sort of uh, gorgeous, favorite, innocent, no one could ever say a bad word about her. And to chuck to have that character and then put a media background in that you've got journalists trying to stage him and all of this happens. We see mm. it in all forms. Like whenever there's a viral story, people will tweet and they'll say, let's wait for something else to come out. And they always dig. They always try and find what those things are. Another really fun current one, Captain Tom. We all knew that. I don't want to go into that, but mm. Mm, the family just pocketing all this money, took a 100-year-old to Barbados, and he's clearly ill on the photos. It's like, but the, oh, but he, they couldn't be terrible because it's Captain Tom. And, and a couple of years later everyone starts figuring it out. We all really it's, do it from day one. It's, really it's, random yeah. side piece, sorry. But, no, but I love, it, it's, I love it's this film doing that. It, mm. The media's like a character. The like their presence, character. hiding from the, hiding in the doors, not being afraid of the place, but being afraid of the cameras to catch them doing stuff. That's what I find really interesting. It's invading the private life. It's twisting the story and it's kind of generating new stories based off hearsay and various different things. And it's it's really well put together and i guess it, it's down to kind of the genius of amy as a character that she's kind of manipulated it so that she doesn't even have to be there and it will just fall to pieces uh for nick um as part of their wedding anniversary game and stuff like that and every single thing leads it to kind of more suspicion being thrown on him um but no the the media is definitely a character even to the point where you know when nick gets the uh tv interview he says like you you literally like you pretty much destroyed me and now you're kind of turning around and going, actually, do you know what? We don't think you're you're that bad. It's like, what what are you doing? Like, you know, you you despisable people. You you turned the world against me, and now you're kind of not even apologising. You're just going, oh yeah, it was a news cycle. You know, get over it, kind of thing. Um, it's it kind of shows off that industry in quite a horrible light. And you know, paparazzi have been, you know, they are the villains of almost every story. Um, and. Yeah. You know, for years now, people have been saying that for, you know, real world situations and even for fictional ones. But yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. They bring that in as a character because this film wouldn't be the same if it was, say, set in the 70s. There would be no nowhere near as big of a media frenzy kind of centered around the husband um, and stuff like that. It's it's really interesting that it was set in that time and kind of, you know, almost the perfect storm for it. Yeah, and I think it's that right gap of media where it's before like it is now when everyone's getting their phones out recording everything. It's that, mm. I know the book came out in 2012, but it's that early 2010s, like the media's this huge thing, but we're not at the point where everything, everyone, everywhere records everything, everything, you know, that's what... Kick, that, kicking off of online media as well, becoming bigger. Yeah, yeah, that, that it's like the entry point of that, and I, I think the film delivers with that, and that could very easily come across wrong. It's not done in a ha ha. The media's bad. It's very. It's weird if the story. And even when you bring in Tyler Perry playing mm. Tanner, we meet him through the media before. And when he finally calls Ben Affleck, he's like, "I've been waiting for this moment for ages." And it's this moment because they've had the media representation. He's been batting his corner before they meet. It's a very, very unique way to to play to play the story around it itself. Even when Amy's at the apartment, you know, the trailers watching the TV. The you know, I followed this case uh, and all these sorts of things. I absolutely love how they built it, but we will talk about Amy. I think we should save us all last because it's probably gonna yeah. be the biggest conversation we spend. I mentioned Tyler Perry. I've not seen many Tyler Perry films, if I'm being really honest with you. I know a lot of people don't like his comedy. I know he's done like the whole Big Mama's House, that sort of comedy like, where he plays like multiple people, right? Um, mm. I don't know if he was in Big Mama's House, but that's just the first one of those films that jumps to mind. Um I he, think he does great. Medea as his character. What are your thoughts? I mean, have you seen him in much? Because I, I haven't. 
So it, it's harder for me to sort of say, oh, I was completely blown away by Tyler Perry. It didn't take me out of the film. But at the same time, it it didn't, you know, do anything bad. I thought he was just a pretty great addition to the cast. It's a very good ensemble. I, and if people are wowed by the fact he's done different things, that he's done mm. comedies, then it's great that he got to do a drama. And I'm pretty sure he's like, Let's ignore the comedy side of things. I'm, I'm sure I've read before, like, he is very, very, not wealthy, but I feel like businessman type wealthy, that he's invested money into a lot of other things across life. I could be completely wrong. But um, he's, um, I'm pretty sure he's like, yeah, he is very, very rich, but I don't know why, whether it's production or whether it's something like that. Um, He's he's very wealthy, but sadly, as far as his acting career is concerned, he's mostly done his own kind of produced stuff, and that stuff is it, the people of a certain audience like it. I mean, his is Medea. I mean, in England, we have Mrs. Brown's Boys. I'm not a big fan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure he did a Medea where Mrs. Brown was, or one of the other they met, or something like that. Mm. Um, but this is easily without even looking at any of his other stuff this is his best performance of his career um i think one of the big things i remember because this was one of the first years where i was kind of quite heavily following the oscars and i remember people saying it was a snub for him to not be in the not at least considered for the nomination for best supporting actor i remember there being a lot of people at the time saying it's so out of character for him to be acting this good and he plays the role so well um, of like a kind of confident lawyer who comes in and all, not quite saves the day, but at least kind of adds enough input into the story and, you know, acts that kind of slick, cool character and, you know, handles the pressure and various different things. Like, I really enjoyed his performance in this film. I really do. And I, I'm not sure whether I kind of agree with it now, whether it would have been nominated or not. But I remember at the time there being a lot of people talking about it being one of the big snubs of the year um, amongst many snubs. Um, but no, I haven't seen any of his other stuff. Um, have you got any clarity on why he's rich? <laughs> um, apparently, he produces most of his own films, so I'd imagine there you go. there's probably a lot of actual self funding involved. It's, it's probably a Taylor Swift situation where uh, that's he's, he's taking, who came he's to taking mind. an unbelievable cut of the profits and you know, yeah, put, puts yeah. the money in, get, get, gets the reward for it. it George yeah. Lucas was very famous for doing that back, uh, for the prequels as well, so just smart business work, to being honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it shows that there was even crazy if there was an audience to watch those films. Uh, mm. I'm guessing this is probably more of a cultural divide of the comedy that, you know, the same way that some comedians make it in America, not in the UK, vice versa, but very rarely do you get someone that works on both America and British shores. His films, I'd imagine, are a lot, lot bigger in America than they have been over here. Without without sort of generalising our country, it's just that sort of comedy has never took off here in the UK, especially at cinemas. Um, but we talk about Tyler Perry. Let, let's talk Neil Patrick Harris, playing off Desi. Character who I remember being in a lot more than he actually was, but of course has the standout scenes of the film. Um, now, Neil Patrick Harris is, of course, gay in real life, playing the role of the straight husband. But before anyone says, no, it's not a problem. That's not where I'm going. Given where his character is, I remember this from the time. Now, I used to love How I Met Your Mother. I've never seen the final season still, but I remember watching it at mm. school and I'd watched it through to wherever it got to contextually, like where it was live, I guess. And I'm not saying Neil Patrick Harris was ever an underrated actor, but he was certainly at some point... I don't want to say typecast. Neil Patrick Harris became Neil Patrick Harris. Like, he wasn't Barney Stinson. He is. But Neil Patrick Harris was always himself. Whether that was because I was with Harold and Kumar, whether he'd done a lot of comedy, he's a lot of theatre work, he's in stage work, he's about to be Doctor Who. Yeah. He's got a presence and I know we spoke to Paul last week and he sort of said that he thinks Neil Patrick Harris is miscast in this film I was sort of curious about that heading in because I can't seriously say I like the performance because he's in it for a short amount of time he's not very likeable if I'm being completely honest he's not dislikable he's really a victim of sorts in this Manip a victim of manipulation I guess by Amy to the to the very nth degree of being back at school but his performance I was just a bit sort of not perplexed but I don't know. I, I'm in this weird spell with this performance where I, I don't have a problem with it, but at the same time, it's it's more unique than I think it's like Tyler Perry, right? We spoke about that he changes. He's like a game changer of this film. Like, mm. Just the game of chess. You add Tyler Perry to, to Ben Affleck's Arsenal and Neil Patrick Harris comes in for Amy and it's more like a crushed, crushed soul that we know is like he's going to get absolutely yeah. destroyed on, on the chain. Uh, and, that, and that is what happens and it is used to, you know, for, for herself and 
ends up a further victim by the, staging the stories and, and whatnot. And I just, I don't know, I can't wrap my head around the performance because I, I don't really have issues with it. But at the same time, I'm not, I do wonder if if maybe, I don't even say his miscast could someone else present because playing the rich the rich guy with Sim do, we know he can do, but playing him with no no charisma is where it's more of a test and I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on this rewatch. I don't know what your thoughts are. I'm, I've, I'm finding it really hard to kind of pick anyone who could come into that role. For some strange reason, Jeremy Strong immediately comes to mind. Um, but I don't know whether he would have been back then in not that as kind of... I think he'd done, I think he'd done stage stuff and a couple of things, but not... Yeah, that, that would and be And also then he'd just be playing Kendall Roy. Of course, of course. But um, It'd be great, I, though, just being sad that Amy left him 20 years ago. Tim yeah, exactly. Um, but, I mean, Neil Patrick Harris plays that kind of cold, obsessive very well. Um, and his role in the film is kind of showing Amy the consequence of her actions. And there are a few characters like the the trailer park people, um, not the trailer park people, the uh, motel people and um, and this, where it kind of shows that Amy has the upper hand and then it slowly turns. And this is her kind of desperation moment where she calls on him. Um, and he's quite a desperate character who's been kind of formed in that kind of shell that, you know, Amy left. And, you know, he's kind of suffered from that. And she has to kind of, take it on herself towards the end and she has to kind of clean up her own mess that she created yeah. um and i i think he fits the role fine i wouldn't say he was miscast um he definitely has done a lot of comedic performances but he's more known for his kind of wackiness in his role i know how i met your mother he was iconic in that role and i've, I've seen him in other stuff so i've seen him in starship troopers where he's fantastic um he's also been um Dr. Horrible's single on blog, where it's kind of more comedic played, and Count Olaf uh, from the um, yeah. series of Unfortunate Events series, where he was fantastic in that role. Um, and he's going to be the lead villain for, you know, the Doctor Who specials. So it's it's not like, you know, he only does comedy. He can do drama as well. He does have a flair to him. And maybe it goes along with the shock value that a character or an actor that is so flamboyant is completely stripped back of emotion. And you can see kind of how obsessive that kind of Barney Stinson role would be if he didn't have charisma, if it was just the pure yeah. obsession. Um, and that's kind of what you get. So I think it's actually well cast if that's the case. Um, and it shows that he's actually an actor with range. Um, he plays the role perfectly. I, I, don't, I don't see any issue with it at all. Yeah, no, I get that. It's just a bit strange, and I'm not quite sure why. And I want to kind of talk about. I know the fact to mention that his game stuff. So this is where it gets all yeah, interesting. Yeah. That we'll sort of segue into Rose and Pipe. We'll talk about these two together. So, one of the stories, the <clears throat> that's being spoken about the most behind the scenes is actually their, their sex scene with each other before the death. Now, David Fincher had them rehearse this, and apparently Rose and Pipe didn't sort of call it out, but she sort of. We know we know how Finch is going to do it, right? That this has got to be recorded, like it's got to be done, rehearsed, the empty degree. Now, I'm not saying he was cast for this, whatever. I don't mean it in, in this way, but apparently Rosen quite was quite uncomfortable with it, and she actually said, "She goes, I've got a husband. He has a husband. So us two doing these sorts of scenes together, it's very different." She goes, "In rehearsing these scenes, on not on a set, is tough to do, but they obviously did it for five, for, I think two to five hours, and." It's a very short scene. Obviously, it's one of the most important scenes of the film, but apparently Finch was very specific as well about rehearsing. It had to be done this, 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 this. God knows how many takes they did. Um, but I find it really interesting that when they spoke about the behind the scenes of that, that I think in, in, this sounds so strange, and I hope this doesn't come across wrong because it's not my intention, but it's actually quite smart to cast like a, a gay actor in that role because if that, I don't want to say it makes the actress comfortable, obviously didn't to a massive degree, but... I think there's something about that that works. I'm trying to think of the right word in my head. Is it is it almost it's a very the, tough the subject? Un, right? The unease of the situation because realistically, her character has to play along with actually wanting it, but actually doesn't want it. So it kind of and knowing she's going to kill him. Yeah, exactly. And, and knowing that she's going to kill him in that scene, in that way, the rehearsal thing. I understand, and I do think Rosamund Pike is that she obviously she spoke about and she obviously enjoyed the football. We'll talk about her performance because she's amazing, but the cold as you mentioned the coldness right of him it sort of works as he's getting more emotional in, in that scene at least his demise and she was always playing him along from the very first moment the bit where she's playing at the, the the cameras and she you know fakes the injuries again throws herself into the wall 
it's quite terrifying. The, the whole build-up is that scene. And the, where even when she gets back in the car, covered in the blood, she just meticulously found everything. And, and I just think the Rosamund Pike side of things, is, is she's, it's her film. Uh, and we've said that a lot, right, with, with these French roles, that an actor comes in and acts, absolutely steals it in almost yeah. every performance. I think, that I'm just scanning in my head everything we spoke about so far. I think this is the best performance in a Fincher film, probably sat in a top two with oh, social network. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was going to say social social network. I, I but that's like social network. I think of every performance, every performance I, in that film no is one, good. Even no one steals the show. Is good, you know, like yeah, like but, no one steals that film. But I can't not think of Rose and Pike. There's the first no. shot, and the opening shot, the way it was, the intentional choice of it being her, amazing Amy, who's she's a famous author because she's manipulated her own life into presenting like, fictional. I, mm. I dropped out of volleyball. Amy made the team. She's lived a life of unhappiness and she's used that unhappiness to become very successful. And even a Scoot McNary who comes in for one scene, um, who is a massively underrated actor who doesn't pop up in a lot of films. The one scene of him and Ben Affleck when he's like absolutely terrified at the table, he talks through really about, about the rape scene and what happened. Hmm. And it's like you can f hear the fear in his voice uh, about everything. And what that sort of does, it sort of builds up Amy Moore as this horrible, horrible person. And if the performance of Rosamund Pike doesn't deliver on the sort of horrors we're going to find out and what we continue to find out, the film won't work. Uh, yeah. And I just have to think, again, I'm not 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 unfairly on Reese Witherspoon. I don't want to sit and say I don't think anyone could have played this role, but... Because Rosamund Pike, I don't think she's a household name in a really polite way. She's a phenomenal actress, but she's never... I know she's dying every day, and that was like one of her very first roles, 21-year-old, but mm. she was... I wouldn't call her a commercial actress. She's not done big films. She's never had... I don't think the accolades others have had. I think she picks her projects very wisely. Uh, and I think that helps the, the mystery around Amy. We're not sitting here waiting... Well, when's Lady Gaga going to turn up in this dramatic role? And Aaron, mm. no, it's it's not that. We we don't know a lot about her. And one thing I read, which was remarkable, that one of the reasons they cast Rosamund Pike is because they said she can look young in scenes, she can look older in scenes. She's got like a very unique face facial figure for that. Uh, that the costume department could sort of play around with that how they wanted to. And I sort of did think about that. We know Ben Affleck can't exactly play like a 25 role, but she can. And she can play someone in her forties if she wanted to. It's, just, it's a very intriguing thing to think about. I've never really seen from a casting department before. Mm. She has flexibility in the role because of being cast in that mid range, and you know, I, I don't see really anyone else filling this role because she does such a good job of it. Um, it is her performance is terrifying, and it it's just it, it, yeah. It's just so well put to screen that you're able to kind of see her gears tick and see how she thinks, but you can go, no, that's that's so wrong, but she still does it anyway. It's it's an exciting performance to see, and I don't think people give it enough recognition. I'd say it's really difficult to put it at number one of the best kind of Fincher performances because yeah. I, I, I it, it's definitely in the top kind of ones and it definitely should have been given more recognition for it um than it was but she she has that kind of cold look in her eyes that friendly kind of that friendly smile that she gives to kind of all of her neighbors and stuff like that and she's able to manipulate it but then she's able to kind of switch it on the spot and go kind of full psycho mode it's it's so unexpected and yet it's kind of right there below the surface you can see that almost immediately it's it's played so well and she holds the film together because she's the one who kind of ties everything in as a as a character you know she's the one who sets the games with ben affleck she's the one who you know sets all the kind of traps and stuff like that with the neighbors she's the one who kind of pushes the narrative and we follow her for pretty much the entirety of the second half of the film to kind of show her process of how she was able to get through it and also you know her, her genius behind it um I mean, the film's told through diary entries and yeah. the fact that the diaries are told kind of monotonally and, you know, kind of almost methodically that you get that sense of Christ. She she could easily be a serial killer with the way that she's talking about things. She could easily be, you know, you know, the villain of the film. And I guess 
in some sense she is the villain of the film you know it's it's really it's tough to kind of play it but you know she does it so well and it's i don't think her performances have ever met that standard i mean i watched her in saltburn this year she's great in saltburn but it's a semi comedic performance and i haven't seen any of her other stuff where she's given off kind of a similarly good acting performance from all of the work that she's done yeah and i think when when you sort of essence out of the court there's there's two it's a film about two terrible people mm. uh in in a in a failed marriage who who won't get out of it that are just going to try and sort of destroy the other one i mean even to the very end when she tells him the story and she's like you can't have a wire so you have to have to get in the shower naked and it's like yeah. her story is is now down and the bell is goes is when she sat down in the hospital chair and it's the the detective rightfully quizzing her everyone enamored by her and she's like well it's your incompetence that would have had these this my husband killed and murdered and it's amazing because we know that's exactly what she'd done on purpose she knew and she'd go there and she was waiting for someone to pipe and to ask those questions and it's a it's a really exciting the, game and behind the scenes you know she's a horrible person but to the camera she's always amazing, amazing Amy. Amy. yeah and yeah. from the way the parents talk about her in public to the locals looking for her uh, and then just every moment of Ben Affleck, just self hatred. Him worried about the affair coming out. It's just so well done. Uh, and even when she does get robbed, and this is what's mm. really interesting, uh, when she gets robbed by I don't know what the, I don't want to call them the hillbillers, um, <laughs> but the trailer trash. That's what we yeah, call it in the, the UK, the motel, right? The motel people. Motel, yeah. 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 Motel um, people. <laughs> and I just love that moment where, for the first time, she's afraid, and it's like we get to see her. Because her plan's gone wrong. She doesn't know what to do. She's in the house. She almost gets caught by the police. She almost gets found by the police. Mm. And it's like, okay, I need, new, I need to get to Daniel Patrick Harris. And, and I'll figure it out from there. And I love that she's just so so well organized in that respect. And Ben Affleck's just bumbling immediately. And kind of in a way, although neither of them wins, I, I think mm. Ben Affleck's the one with the sort of, not moral high ground, but Ben Affleck's the one who, in theory, he ends up living when he could have had the death penalty. And he ends up having but stopped her plan. So he he loses. Really he loses because he has to kind of live. Now he's trapped with, with her. He's trapped with yeah. her. You know, he has to put on a show. Whereas she was previously putting on the show, she doesn't have to anymore. She she can't do anything wrong at that point. Whereas he's still right on the cliff edge, and she's going to hold him over there for like the rest of his life. You know? And if they have that kid, and it's it's and again, you mentioned Margot earlier. Margot's final scene is her crying on the floor of the table, knowing her, yeah, because her she she stuck. knows that she knows that she's never going to get her brother back. It's done. It's over. I just think it's just remarkable, and it's worth talking about. We're still talking about performances a bit, but there's so much more that makes this film. And I want to I want to talk the score. So yes. we're uh, we're in this sort of phase now where Trent Reznor and Akers Ross are firmly as part of the the, the group of Fincher. Mm. The score for this. Is amazing, and it's like what we spoke about last week. That with a Fincher film, it's not really music you can sort of listen to. I'm sure you can. I know Social Network's got a lot of fans in the soundtrack, but the score for this is uneasy, and that's like the understatement of the year. And I believe the idea came is they went to a spa, and I guess this is more America, but spas play very relaxing music, slow themes, and they came up with the idea of if we use this sort of tempo about Amy, but we can use our own, I guess, I, I'm, I'm not there for the music side of things, but the instruments they use or the, or the sound music they, that they make is very digital. Mm. It makes every scene like uneasy that Amy's in, that it's never blaring, it's never this, it's just tense. Calm. And I love and I love the score, and I think that's what makes the score sort of quite terrifying around her is that they know how to use it. And it's such a... I don't want to sit there and say Trent Reznor and Akers are underrated. They did the Soul soundtrack a couple of years ago. Like they've done more than just Fincher films, but their collaboration with him again, it it's on a. Pro I don't. Did they do the killer? I mean, I'm, I know we haven't seen it yet. We'll talk about it in a few weeks, but it kind of makes me excited to see if they are with him, like what they're doing for it. But what yeah. are your thoughts on that score as well? And it's just weird, like to, to come up with a, a soundtrack based on being a spa. That there's they, they did the score. They did the score to the killer. They did the score to the killer. Um, yeah, it's it's so calm and relaxing when you're listening to it outside of the film. And yet when you're watching the film, it's so tense and on edge. Um, I'd completely forgotten about the score until this rewatch. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is the weird score where it's like really, really calm and relaxing. But at the same time, you're so on edge and it does add that uneasiness. And it's kind of the marriage between the kind of what you see on screen and the music of the film. 
and it works perfectly. Um, just the kind of the, the melodic kind of gent gentle waves of music that come over you whilst, you know, someone's being accused of, you know, kidnapping, murdering and possibly raping his wife. It's like there's so much going on there. Um, it it works so well. And yeah, it doesn't scale up at any point. It doesn't, you know, attack you. It just sticks to that tempo all the way through and just keeps you on edge all the way through, all the way, just all the way till the final shot. It it works so well, and it's so unusual to see a score like this. Um, I can't think of any other film that kind of employs this technique to kind of gain tension just from how calm the music is. Usually tension's driven by kind of, you know, big kind of, you know, build-ups of scores and stuff like that. But this doesn't have a build-up. It's just in the background, always there, underneath the surface, which I guess is exactly what, you know, Amy's character plays off as. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think about it. There is a film... That I just can't think of it and I can't think of the mm. soundtrack. But I, I'm just think I'm just picturing a close up of a character and everything's blowing around him. It's not Oppenheimer. Um God, that's gonna annoy me. But yeah, it, it's a unique way to the score. And I, I think it works so much better than any and I think that's why like Fincher's films aren't just standing out on a visual standpoint, a technical standpoint. They sound different. And mm. and that creates just a different feeling for everybody experiencing that. And especially at a cinema, the the way that, that is on the speakers, that how it plays out is so much more impassionate than just Generic sound or let's do a needle drop. None of that is straight to the point. But um, respect about music. Let's, let's talk a bit more past this. Let's let's talk the film coming out. So mm. it's the highest grossing David Fincher film, three hundred sixty-one yeah. million dollars worldwide on a sixty mil budget. As I said, it was very much hyped at the time. Uh, it was a big adaptation. People have been talking about it, um, and it's no surprise it's his highest grossing film, especially on, on the run after doing God Dragon Tattoo, after doing. Social Network and Benjamin Button, that sort of four big ones in a row for him with respect to sort of the worldwide growth and, and growing audiences. But we, we've mentioned the Oscars a bit already. So only have one nomination for Best Actress for Rosamund Pike. And she lost mm. to Still Alice for a Julianne Moore, which is very understandable. Um, I was very surprised to see this wasn't... I didn't have an adapted screenplay nomination. Now, I don't normally sit here and just moan about the Oscars, this, that, this could have happened, that could have happened especially when it's a very contextual ceremony. It's always, you know, about the, what was marketed the best, what had the right time, what had the most attention. This only premiered at New York Film Festival. This didn't premiere at any others. Um, screenplay, I can't go over. Uh, and these are the nominees for the year. Imitation Game, fair enough, that one. American Sniper, America, can't get past that. Mm. And that was a humongous film when that came out. Inherent Vice, The Theory of Everything, and still the most bonkers one, Whiplash. Um, only because guess, it was a short Whiplash film. Whiplash got nominated because it was a short film adapted into a longer yeah, format. Yeah, and I get that. And it's a phenomenal script, but I'm, I'm just... How this did... I mean, American Sniper was very much that... America, right? That, that was yeah. just... That, that's the answer. Like, it was huge. And I really enjoyed the film. I think Bradley Cooper's phenomenal in that film. Um Clint Eastwood directs that I, I know, and obviously again with what happened in real life with the, the, the actual real life person, I sound well, a lot more. Sa sad, sadly, that film's only remembered for a baby, um, and you know, yeah, well, and the real life guy getting, uh, yeah, killed. of course, but yeah, but the baby is. Um... There is there is certain there is certain irks that I have with the set of Oscars. For one, there was only eight nominees that year. Um, you know, At it's 10. yeah. Um, this film could have been in there so could Interstellar realistically and they weren't nominated for Best Picture which is a bigger mission um, Rosamund Pike I think has a good shout of beating out Julianne Moore for Best Actress here um, on reflection um, I think her performance is more memorable over time um, I haven't rewatched Still Alice in a while but I, I, I genuinely think this performance is better. Funnily enough, Reese Witherspoon did actually get nominated that year. I know, I was um, thinking that. <laughs> for Wild, which was really interesting. Um, I, I can fully understand various other things. I don't understand why this didn't get nominated for Best Score. And I genuinely do not understand why this didn't get nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, it's crazy. And also, I, I throw the hat in for film editing as well, because I think this film is very well put together. Um, and structured and edited, um, but yeah. some sometimes I mean that year was pretty stacked as far as films are concerned, getting nominated. So um, that that makes sense. But 
you know, that was the year where Lego Movie didn't get nominated for Best Animated Feature, and you know, and given that Mank would get nominated for like ten, I remember it was one of those, right? I'm pretty I, sure it was. I'm pretty yeah. sure Mank had like ten nominations, zero wins, because uh, that, that was I, obviously when we did only, uh, Do you know what? We'll go into it when it gets to it. But the only reason why that got nominated for so much was because it's of Citizen Kane. Yeah, yeah, of course literally. it was, and it, it came out in December. It came out in December as well. Like that's yeah. the big thing, just in time. Um, but, but yeah, that, yeah. It, the, the Oscar stuff's interesting. But I mean, we talk about how it's today. Gone Girl's not a film that pops up, but I think you talk to people about Gone Girl. A lot of them have heard of it. A lot of them have seen it. And I've never heard a single person say, do you like that film? I've never once had that chat. And I think this is, I'm not going to call it Fincher's best film. As we said earlier, right? There's a top four or top five. This is at the top end of his work by Country Mile. And it kind of leaves me in this weird phase where, again, I know The Killer's got a very limited cinema release, but I know he's a mind hunter. I know he did House of Cards. He's done a lot of the streaming services that have followed. I'd love to see him get a budget again and, and make a proper mm. film. Again, I'm not seeing the killer. I know you have, but I miss seeing his films in the cinema. I miss yeah. seeing, like, there's a Finch film coming out. You just don't get that with streaming. Uh, and sorry, you don't get that with Netflix releases because Netflix is all about what's coming out next week? What's coming out next week? Mm. Apple, to their credit, we spoke because of Flower Moon, they'll market the shit out of anything. They've got a film to market. They will focus on that one film. They will market that film. They'll push that film. Netflix is a brilliant. We've got eight coming up in eight weeks. Pick, take your pick. Done. Leftover. Let's not talk about it again. Uh, and I think we look at Gone Girl having its legacy. Uh, and I think it's already outlasted the film that came after. Mm. And, and again, we'll look at Rosamund Pike. Is it the best performance of her career? Yes. We'll look at Ben Affleck. Is it the best performance of his career? Potentially. Um, for them, very for... definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's what we're saying about every week. Every week we come on and say he gets David Fincher the directs the film. He gets the best out of the lead actor, lead mm. actress, and it tends to happen. And as you said earlier, the, these are all first time. It's not him bringing. I'm pretty sure Brad Pitt's like one of the only recurring actors on Fincher films, like in lead roles as well. I think yeah. he's the only one to have done to have done it. He's done it three times. Um, and strange enough, Brad Pitt was almost in this. And I think love Brad Pitt dodged a bullet. I can't see Brad Pitt in this role, not at all. Ben Affleck like nailed could, it. Could you see Brad Pitt as Desi? Ah, uh, he'd be too cool. No, no, it'd be too, he would be too desirable. Mm. Uh, one thing I want to say, I haven't sort of spoke about Ben Affleck yet. We we mentioned Batman. I mentioned the behind. You know, there we've reached this point now with real life stories with film, right? Where some behind the scenes stories are so famous they're boring. You yeah. all know about Lord of the Rings. Aragorn broke his toe when he kicked the helmet. You know, there's always one. What? I never heard that one before. <laughs> Gone, Gone Girl has two. And I don't know if you know both of these. The first one's the most obvious, right? Ben Affleck was cast as Batman. Mm -hmm. And the costume department had to like change the sizes of his clothes because he was bulking up across the filming, which is incredible because yeah. you think Finch would be the one director to be like, stop that. But I, I don't think it's noticeable, if I'm being really honest. And the costumes, it, it's generic. The purpose was a, a, a conscious point. The costumes were just generic, like casual clothes. It's about a married couple. It, it's it's nothing mm. extravagant, no suits, no ties. Just wake, woke up, got dressed, went to work. But do you know about the baseball cap drama? And, and this is one I remember. No, at the time. I don't know about the baseball cap drama. Okay. You know American sports, not me. Ben Affleck I is do. obviously from Boston. He's um, a massive Boston sports fan. He, the scene of him at an airport, he yeah. is meant to wear a Yankees hat. And production, and I remember this, this was all over. because You know, like the typical like chat show talk. Yeah, yeah, Ben Affleck refused to wear a Yankees hat on set. Filming was shut down for four days over the hat. And they had to reach an agreement that he would not wear a Boston hat. He would not wear a Yankees hat. He picked another team, I don't know. Um... But they had to agree on a neutral team for him to wear the hat from. Um, and I'm guessing the scene's like a minute long. But you know what? I've got mad respect to Ben Affleck for doing that because we we've got we've got like sports backgrounds, right? We know what that would be. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that he he did that. That it, and I can just imagine it being this really petty, like mm. oh, he'll he, get over it. He ended up wearing a Mets hat, which yeah, that's fine. I, I, I guess yeah. why, right? They they needed because he's from New York, they need him to wear some a New York a New York type team. branding. Yeah, but I, I just again I don't know the difference of as, of as I'll, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest as as myself a, a pretty big Red Sox fan. Yeah, you don't mess with that, and as a sports fan in general, that's like someone asking me to put on like a Man United 
like hat or shirt or something like that i i would i would tell them to go the other way you know it's <laughs> same with if someone's like oh george we need you to wear this tottenham um hat yeah, for this well, version <laughs> not a chance <laughs> and i just i love it. And it it doesn't it doesn't happen often on film which never hears to us about this but i think no that, and you know I, I fair really plays after because yeah. that, that shows as well like he really does care he's not just saying it um yeah. But um, yeah, I, sorry, I wanted to bring them up. I just completely forgot to when we were talking about because I absolutely really that <laughs> weird thing to talk about. Do you have a favorite scene? Because favorite's a weird word. I mean, I, the, the there's so many great scene, scenes. The first and end scene, the twin shots, is fantastic. Um, and I'll be perfectly honest, the best scene in the film is the revelation where she shows how she got away with it. Yeah. When when basically the story begins to unravel and you're like oh 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 you know um, that scene you know the diary entry the last diary entry if that makes sense before they kind of cut to you know 24 hours from being missing to you know go back in time and reset the clock kind of thing. Uh, yeah, oh, it's it's tricky. I'm trying to come up with the best one. Um, mm. There are so many great scenes, right? And it's like these escalation tipping points of where it builds up to holy fuck. Um, I'm not going to go for the interview. Interview is a good I'm, scene. The interview is a very good scene. And I, lo I like seeing smug Ben Affleck. I also like smiling, creepy Ben Affleck. Um, I think that's become just like an, an insane like image. The fact, again, it's very real, right? The, the photographer says, do a smile. He does the smile. I, yeah. Ah, oh, picking the. It, I'm gonna go. It's not bad if you pick the same scene. <laughs> no, no. I'm I'm trying to reach like at what point in my head does this film like absolutely peak? And it's it's not Neil Patrick Harris if it's not her being trapped. I think it's the the Punch and Judy doll. Mm. Maybe not favorite scene, but where the film's going. When the revelations are coming left, right, and center, and it's this big game with the clues in there, I don't know. I, I find it tricky. Or maybe, maybe I'm just going back to simple choice of, of his smile scene because that epitomizes the film, right? Just this bumbling. The sugar moral. scene's pretty. Both versions of the sugar scene's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we didn't speak about Emily Ratajkowski in this. Very contextual no. for 2014 because of blurred lines, but um, yeah, mm. it, it was the the film that obviously she did acting, and apparently she actually. To end up in a Finch film, he's not casting you because you've done a music video. I mean, I know he's done music videos, but what young student, 20 years, 20, 30 years younger, love mm -hmm. all that sort of not not the cheating side of it, but the whole angle of yeah, let's just cast a supermodel. Done. Yeah. Like worked. Um, I can't pick a favorite scene. I, I love every scene in the film. It, it, it's it's like an experience that you don't get often these days, right? When you go to the cinema and watch a film, a film will just peak and in, not that you lose attention. But every single scene, you're sort of more invested, and you don't think you can be more invested. And then there's another twist, and then this happening, and it's never too much. There's never too much of it happening, and that's why I'm really struggling to pinpoint a, a moment which sort of defines it for me. The murder is up there as like watching it for the first time. That was like a what the fuck moment. It's not my favorite scene, but I also do want to talk about the Scott McNary scene because that changes the whole game when he comes on board and he realizes this, this guy that's been marked as this like rapist, horrible person. Is a victim, and it's like his whole life has been destroyed and ruined because of this author. Mm. That's like a big moment, but I, I, I'm you know, I'm going to go blank on the scene because I can't pick one. I just that's fair. I keep it's, having it is, it is a the very music. Good film. The I music's mean... playing in my head, which is making it <laughs> worse because it's then going. It's it's then going back to the the Punch and Judy. You know when the the camera's panning out and the sounds yeah waving in. Oh, I mean, the, I, the I, 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 I want is uh, here's my question to you. Out of all of the famous, I know there's been many famous shots from Fincher. Is the opening closing scene his most famous, or would you go for something like Fight Club, Buildings, Seven, Box, you know? I mean, Seven, the box itself isn't iconic. It's more the scene, but the, yeah. the defining, I don't want to call it the defining image of his career, but in the placement of the films and where we're up to, it has to be right near the top, right? If it's not at the mm. top, it's in the top three. And, and I'll look at. I get. I guess Fight Club ending with the buildings collapsing but, is pretty I mean, iconic. Even, yeah, like iconic shots. You've yeah, you got Fight Club and Seven. Yeah, 
that like in, whether individual... it's the best shot or not. Yeah. Like when I watch Fight Club, you guys any like, yay, that was the plan, great. Like my, my enjoyment comes from the other stuff. But getting to the ending is this uh, satisfaction of fuck. Like they've they've built to this horror. You go back mm. to the beginning of want to bash a skull in type thing, and then like, the yeah, ending is now. like I just want to know what you're thinking. Like, <laughs> and it uh, it's could it be the best story of his career? But then then I'm thinking. But then you've got Jesse Eisenberg refreshing Facebook at the end, and yeah. that's contextually. Uh, as big any moment as anything else. So mm. Facebook ironic creation is down to the fact he was rejected. I mean, by okay, if, if, okay. I know this is. I know we're getting towards the end of the Fincher retrospective, but on a tangent here because I wasn't on the review. Um, my favorite Fincher scene is "I'm coming back for everything." So <laughs> it's a great scene, um, and that again, that film, right? That's like an escalation. Mm. The whole film's escalation. Let's let's split the court case in two, and let, let's do the court case whilst the event's happening on screen. Yeah, uh, I think I think Fincher. We talk about this. I think his actual narrative structure is very underrated. People don't talk about mm. actually how he structures his films. Benjamin Button, as I know, I was on that review. I was very surprised at how how well that was edited. I I really like Benjamin Button. on you know rewatch. Uh, and we spoke about Scorsese even back because the Fire Moon deep dive video, and, and he's had these film schoolmaker working with him for decades. Soundtrack composers, his cast of course, De Niro, DiCaprio. The, the best artists surround themselves with the best people available, but the people they know are going to do it for them. When Finch is popping up with like different people at every film, like he doesn't have the mm. same DP every time. He score, yes, he started using uh, Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross. It's a really interesting career, and, and it's so hard to pinpoint because I think he could generally change any given day. So, I said to me, what, what's the defining shot of Chris Mann's career? I can straight away probably say the final shot of, of Oppenheimer with Kelly Murphy staring. That will go down as the defining image of Mann's career, I think. Uh, I feel the spinning top is still up there, but like what epitomizes the experience. And but with Fitch, oh, what, I, I can't, I what can't, epitomizes can't. what epitomizes the experience that okay, I guess the epitomizing experience with um with Fincher would either be you know the, the I mean, I, when I think of so, when or, I think of Fight Club, I'm thinking Brad Pitt topless with the fist ready to fight. I'm because thinking, that, that image I'm is, thinking is buildings easy. collapsing at the end, personally, but um, or gun in the mouth at the start. Um, yeah, it's an interesting talk. I mean, seven what's in the box is immediately what I think yeah. of. Yeah, you can go that's through the best scene. See, scene wise, you're getting that. You, for me. you can go, you can go through pretty much every single Finch film and pick a defining moment. But with this film, it's really tough because there are quite a few defining moments in the film. Um, the opening and closing shot bookends it, but realistically, within the film itself, there are so many little kind of, you know, breakdown moments which you know you could put forward as being the best scene in it and you know as far as his career is concerned i mean you think it's one of his best in his career i think it's one of his best in his career um so it's got to be up there with some of the scenes that are kind of put forward yeah no i'm i'm, I'm with you on that mm. i'm trying to segue into moving from scenes to final i mean do you want to do final thoughts I mean, sorry, we've we've just done final thoughts yeah you know like this this is we're, this we're is a fantastic like to to i mean i'm gonna go ahead and say it. go watch it because it's on um both disney plus and netflix at the moment i want to say in the uk um most of fincher's stuff is available on either of those two websites um so I'd, I'd highly recommend going back through and watching with our retrospective um i know at this point in the review people have probably gone you know and already watched this film again or you're just kind of watching for the commentary at this point but if this hasn't sold you on re-watching it i'd highly recommend going and re-watching it and you know commenting along and kind of telling us what your thoughts and opinions are what is your favorite fincher you know scene um going into the final kind of episode with mank coming up and then we'll have our top 10 as well coming out soon after but also you know what's your opinions on this film because we always want to hear the discussion about it so you know i think you know go rewatch the film because it's worth the rewatch, and then come back and comment when you've got your opinions definitely um and sort of rounding out with that as well we know we mentioned we've got mank coming next we're heading to november it's going to be a busy mm. month the time of recording. We've just got the Dot 2 announcement. So luckily, that's not all of November. That's mm -hmm. going to spread into December. We've got the Disney ranking for the 100th anniversary. We've got a lot of other stuff happening. We've got stuff happening in the background. We're prepping for other things for next year. So um, it's going to be a busy month. We've got a couple more Fincher stuff to do. Uh, so the Killer's going to be Monday the 13th. That's going to be out streaming for when that review goes up. Um, 
And as always, thank you to everyone who's been watching, commenting along with us. Taser, let us know your thoughts on those. Go get us on social media. We've been very lucky. We just got to do a giveaway last week. There's going to be a couple more 4K reviews going up in the next couple of weeks as well. So we're getting back on track with that as well. So that's going to be it for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. Take care.